So the trophy was uh, manufactured by John Barnard and Sons of London. It's 90 ounces of uh, solid silver, originally gilded, but uh, over the years the gilding has worn off. And uh, this is the first time that the trophy has travelled outside the United Kingdom and come to Australia for the, uh, for the championship. Uh, it's a very historic trophy. It's the oldest trophy in the world for a world championship. It predates the Claret Jug for the British Open and it even predates the Wimbledon uh, men's singles trophy, which are, both of which are some years younger than this trophy. Uh, it's had a storied uh, career won by all the great uh, champions uh, over the years and uh, we're delighted to have it here in Australia uh, for presentation to the 2019 World Digit Championship here at the RACV Club in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, <laughs> Uh, this is the trophy you won for last year's 2018 World Billiards Championships. How do you think you're going to go this year? Well, uh, it's a million dollar question honestly because um, the depth that we have in, in the field of billiards today is absolutely incredible. Um, so many fantastic players all over the, all over the world and uh, you know to pick a winner is so tough. Even last year, you know, I, I know what a tough time I had. You know, especially in the semi-final, I was down by 550 points, and to win that match, and then, you know, the finals—it's—it's—it's it's, it's a huge deal, honestly. Um, so, um, to pick a winner, very tough. I think there are five or six solid players in the world today who are capable of making 500 plus breaks on their given day. So, but yeah, I'm very confident. Um, it's winning the world title last year was a huge monkey off my back, <laughs> and um, I come here uh, with. Uh, more confidence and of course with, with having refined my skills a little more, having changed a few you know, technical aspects of my game, I feel more confident and as I said it's a huge monkey off my back and that's what sport is about, you know, you need that one big uh, break or a win and a world title is a world title in any sport. So uh, I feel good uh, but uh, predicting you know, what the result would be would, would something that I can't do but yeah I know I'm going to give it my best. And yeah, I fancy my chances, so let's see how it goes. Great, great. So how are you finding the conditions in Melbourne? How are the tables running? Oh, I, honestly, I mean, if I have to speak about the city, if I have to speak about Melbourne as a, as a city, as Australia as a country, uh, I love coming here and I've been coming here for the last uh, 12, 15 years. I came here when I was very young, first time. And to be honest with you, I feel like at home in Melbourne because I've been here so many times. I sort of know my ways around here. Uh, so that's as far as the city goes. The weather is fantastic and I, and I also believe that Melbourne gets voted the best city to live in for so many years and stuff like that. So, uh, and I know why it is so because it's such a beautiful city. People are friendly, warm. And uh, coming to the conditions, I think RACV is a fantastic club. Uh, so niche and, and so uh, you know, beautiful. 
especially the billiard room that they have, you know, to have that kind of a setup and infrastructure in, 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 in a place like Melbourne. It's just fantastic. The conditions are beautiful. So many tables. They look gorgeous. So many people back home have asked me, you know, wow, you know, this is such a fabulous place. Where is this? So uh, I think it's great conditions, especially for billiards. Uh, all the tables have been reclothed, which is a great thing. And I think even the players are, are uh, unified in their opinion that these conditions are great to make big breaks and fitting to hold a world championship. So how do you practice billiards? Do you have a routine? Well, um, yes and no. Um, actually, uh, my, my dad, who's basically my coach, and he's also won the world title. Uh, he won the world title in 1990. Wow. And, uh, you know, I've, I've sort of grown up you know, being a world champion son it was always a very, very heavy burden on me, you know. And <laughs> finally, you know, winning the world title last year, was, you know, it was a big deal for us. So he's, he's, he's quite a, a stickler for discipline and, you know, on and off the table. So um, I don't have a set routine as such, but yes, uh, before a big, big event, uh, I, 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 I do make sure that I'm, you know, giving six to eight hours of solid practice. And so does my father. He makes sure that I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, uh, you know, sort of meandering away from from that routine. In fact, before coming here uh, for the World Championship, we are having a big, big festival in India, in, especially in my hometown. It's called Durga Puja. It's huge. It's massive. I mean, you have millions of people thronging from different parts of the country to my city uh, to to worship this particular idol called Durga Ma, and it's it's huge. But um, Unfortunately, I, I didn't go out anywhere. There were no plans with friends because I knew I had to put in, you know, those hours. And, and once, you know, our sport is such that it's so emotionally draining that once your practice is done, you just, you, you don't have anything left in you to be going out and having a good time in the festivities. So, uh, and, and especially because I play snooker as well. So for me to balance both the games, billiards, snooker, they're like chalk and cheese, honestly. I mean, to, to the layman, you'd probably feel that, you know, it's, pretty similar but it's actually chalk and cheese it's very different so I try to juggle my time in between both so I'm playing a little bit of snooker a little bit of billiards so um, nothing fixed as such but yeah I think the main thing is to put in the hours and to 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 be match fresh and I, I think it works for me you know not to exhaust myself playing too many tournaments so uh, well yeah I'm, I'm happy with the way it's going and I'm happy with the way I train and especially having a world champion father as my coach it really helps you know, it's got its plus and the, and, the, and the negatives as well because he's really strict. But you know, yeah, yeah, it's it's nice. It's it's I've got a pretty set routine that way, so I'm happy with it right now. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So there's a twenty-four thousand dollar prize for a one thousand break. Do you think that somebody will get it? Well, uh, to be honest with you, uh, as I said before, there are some really solid players in Frey in this championship. Uh, the conditions are absolutely fantastic. So I wouldn't be surprised, honestly, if there is a thousand break. Um, but having said that, again, it's a huge milestone, a thousand break, and that too with the balk line rule. Uh, and whoever gets that, is, you know, it's, it's going to be worthy of a lot of appreciation because it's such a tough feat to achieve in, in, in modern day billiards. So uh, I wouldn't put, put it past some of the top players. Uh, but again, it's a tough task. But yeah, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Great. I'm George Taylor, I'm Managing Director of Alcox, the most well-known billiard table company in Australia. Henry Alcock arrived in Melbourne in uh, 1853 and shortly thereafter uh, set up a little cabinet making shop in Fitzroy. They've been here in Melbourne making billiard tables for 160 years. Today uh, most of the, the traditional major clubs uh, have a billiard room and the billiard room features an Alcock table. We are producing a product that stands quite happily on the world stage. This game is so demanding that precision is a very, very important factor. It has an important bearing on which timbers are selected for the making of a billiard table. It has a very important bearing on the jointing of those timbers as the table is uh, put together. Uh, it has a very important bearing on the way we treat the issue of the billiard table slate. Uh, we have developed ourselves machinery uh, particularly focused on the question of making sure that the billiard table slate is ground and, and honed 
to a higher level than you'll find anywhere else in Australia. The cushion work must be carried out so that the height of the cushion is exactly what is required for the size of the ball. Uh, the pocket openings of the cushions have also got to be adhered to strictly. Even the cloth is fitted in the traditional way, which is the correct way if you're going to play a high level or a championship level of um, English billiards or snooker. Our family company, um, which is Australian owned and, and operated, uh, is producing a level of product that not only is regarded as the best in Australia, but is uh, regarded highly right throughout the billiards and snooker world. At Reed Furniture, we guarantee better results for students with our Learniture range of ergonomic school furniture. We have more than 50 years of experience in designing educational furniture solutions. Reed also offers a range of flexible, modular furniture which is easy to reconfigure. Transform the classroom from a collaborative learning space to a workshop or an instructor-led environment within minutes. What's more, everything comes with a 10 years warranty. How are you enjoying the championship in Melbourne? How are you finding the tables? Everyone and welcome to the RACV Club in Melbourne, Australia for the final of the 2019 Endeavour Life Care World Billiards Championship. Uh, we're here uh, in commentary. Uh, I'm with uh, Robbie Faldvari, the resident uh, professional here at the RACV Club, and uh, sitting next to us is our producer Dan Lynch from Cuball TV, who's done a fantastic job this week. He's been on deck virtually 12 hours a day for seven days in a row but dad today's the final day and tomorrow you can uh, you can have a sleep in uh, it's been wonderful we've had a fantastic week of billiards here first class billiards from all the top uh, players in the world uh, coming here to the RECV 
They've been staying here at the RECV club, uh, playing in the club's beautiful billiards room on their antique or cock and co uh, tables, uh, refurbished by all cocks uh, to championship standard here. And the players have been full of praise for the conditions, uh, for the accommodation, uh, for the dining options, and uh, for everything associated with the club. It's been a wonderful championship. And the culmination of this championship, of course, is the final. Uh, it's a repeat of, of last year's final between Surav Kathari of India and Peter Gilchrist of Singapore. Uh, last year, uh, Surav uh, won that match uh, in a remarkable performance um, where he, he, he won through in the quarterfinals, the semi-finals and the uh, final of that, that championship in Leeds. There's a 300 break uh, in each of those matches including coming from 500 behind uh, the great David Causier of England in the semi-final uh, before he overcame Peter Gilchrist in the final. We're just seeing a, a shot there of the uh, seating that's been installed at the RACV uh, especially for this week and uh, we've had great crowds in here, a crowd of over 120 on Monday night for the final of the World Open. Good crowds all the way uh, during the week and, uh, and uh, we're expecting excellent crowds uh, today. Uh, the final. So the players are uh, just about to string and get ready. So I'd like to welcome to the microphone Robbie Folgrari. How are you, Robbie? Fine, David. Great to be here. Uh, yeah, it's going to be a very close match. Uh, but it all depends who starts really well. Uh, tend to think Qatari had the had the easier semi, that's for sure. That was quite controversial. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Mike Russell sort of gave up when he still had a slight chance. And to be honest, that I don't think that'll help Qatari. For being so prompt, you've done extremely well. For those of you that uh, do not know me, my name is Paul Cosgrove and I'm the Master of Ceremonies for today. Uh, I think that's because anybody else who could have had the job, Scarpa, did not get the job. So they saw it coming and they said, uh, you best get on your bike. So, uh, the situation is that we're going to start the first session. It will last for two hours. We will also then have a second session at four o'clock, which goes for two hours, and we will then have the final session that starts at 7.30 and goes for one hour. Now, um, in terms of uh, having everything presented here, the first thing I'd like to do is just um, pass a vote of thanks to all the people that have organised this. Uh, we've had the World Championship Organising Committee, We've had uh, the RACB City Club and their enormous cooperation. We've had all our sponsors who've done such great work and provided us for, with the support to be able to do this. And I'd especially like to thank uh, Adam Wyart from the ABSC, Jim Burke from World Billiards Limited, uh, Colin Whitelaw, who's been the Assistant Tournament Controller, Steve Cowie, who's been the Tournament Controller and done a magnificent job, Robert Higgins, who is the man who threatened you with calumny if you didn't get to your correct seat. And uh, of course, um, we couldn't have anything like this without the pro score situation that's been provided by Neville Moore and the streaming that's been provided by Dan Lynch. So could you give a round of applause? For that? <laughs> and so to our final, uh, the first thing I would like to do is introduce our referee, our uh, premier lady referee in all of the states of Australia, etc. And that is Kim Eilert. Uh, our uh, first player is the defending world champion. He had a magnificent year last year in winning the world championship. And he is uh, a credit to the game. And we're extremely fortunate to have him here from India, Suraj Kathari. <laughs> Uh, from uh, Singapore is uh, the number one ranked player in the world. He's had a very successful time since last year's final, but in last year's final he was defeated by Sarab, so this is his chance to have a grudge match recall, and it's from Singapore, Peter Gilchrist. <laughs> Okay, so we're after the introductions there by uh, Paul Cosgriff, who's um, uh, who's introduced our referee for the final, Kim Ibet, uh, for this five-hour final, and uh, he's introduced the players, as you know, Sirav Kathari and Peter Gilchrist, 
So the final is organised on a slightly unusual pattern. We have two <laughs> two hour sessions with uh, a break in between and then uh, another break and uh, the final one hour session. Um, so all of those sessions being uh, brought to you live on the World Billiards YouTube channel by uh, uh, operated by Cubal TV and uh, our producer Dan Lynch. <coughs> We have Cathari to break with the white, and uh, we'll just be fascinating to see the, the opening exchanges in this in this game to see how the players settle down, how they adapt to the table. Of course, both of them had four hours on the table uh, yesterday in the semi-final, so there's right. not really any question of, uh, of getting used to it. Well, uh, there's the first mistake, David. Yeah. Um, mm. I was going to say before mm. we hit that ball, uh, mm. all important to get this cue ball on the side cushion mm. there, mm. and he's hit it way too thick. Any thicker, he would have got the double kiss nearly. Mm, mm. So nervous start or careless start, one or the other. So Peter has got a nice chance. And oh, well. <laughs> well, look, I've been in this situation. <laughs> when you're playing for what something really means for, you know, for personally, there's much more pressure. Um, you know, the, the quarterfinals to both of these players, there's not so much pressure because they've been there before. But... To say you're the world champion after a match like this, you've got to be nervous. And so, unbelievable error, really, by Peter, no. but ex but understandable. So, Qatari now has a nice sort of reverse drop cannon, trying to leave the red over the pocket and create the opportunity for in off yellow as well, if he plays it right. He wanted it the other way but he's got the opportunity there no worries at all so Robbie uh, I know you've played Gil Peter Gilgrist many times uh, have you played uh, Sirav Kathari I think I've only played him once uh, quite a, a few years ago in 150 up and right. that was a massive battle so but I think he's improved a lot since then oh, there's no doubt about that because, so uh, you know he's he's really uh, hit his straps in the last uh, 18 months or so a very solid player he doesn't take risks he's got a very uh, very good pattern to his game and I think actually he reminds me uh, uh, a little bit not that I saw him play but I know from what the Indians told me that their nickname for Wilson Jones the great Indian champion and the first Indian to win a world uh, championship in any sport in 1958 when he won the world amateur billiards championship and his nickname was uh, NRJ they called him no risks Jones so okay. if he had a little uh, fine cut back at the top of the table, he, he would ignore that and just go in off the, go in off the red and, uh, and, you know, go back to hand. Uh, and I think Sir Afghathari yeah. really operates on similar principles. He, you know, his, his game pattern is very sound and, uh, and low risk. I think that's also, that sort of game was much more played years ago. Less potting and uh, more in offs. Uh, probably, probably the you know the, the the change in more snooker on TV. There's a bit more potting, like Corsia and so forth. No no hesitation in mm. potting the ball. I think probably mm. that started in mm. the 80s a bit more. Mm. Well, all the top players these days are just outstanding pots. You know, there's, uh, there's certainly uh, you know no no weaknesses in their game, of course. But Suro, you know, is a top snooker player. He's, yeah. Uh, He's had great success in snooker. Uh, Peter Gilchrist has made a one-four-seven break at snooker, as you say. Corsia, you know, it's a great pot. Um, you know, Matt Bolton, uh, Pankaj, of course. Uh, you know, all the top players are really, really good potters these days. And uh, but you're uh, so right. Mm, you know, mm. sometimes <coughs> in billiards, that that pot is the one that lets you down. Still, mm. Uh, mm. Peter missed a pot off the spot yesterday. Mm. Um, in to let inexplicably, really. Yeah, mm, well, that's mm, but mm. you know th there is a bit more accuracy required in potting mm. uh, than the in off, mm. and it just just lose concentration mm. for a second. But mm. that, you wouldn't expect it. But that's mm. where mm. most of the players will miss. Mm. Now he's just got himself in a, a tricky situation here. He didn't pit. We we're praising his potting, but he didn't quite hit that one hard enough. He was going up for either an in off red or cannon or in off white but he's left the, his ball about a, a foot short of the ideal position so this is actually quite uh, tricky we all know what David Causey would do here he'd uh, be banging this around uh, the red in and out of Bork and the, and the white coming off two cushions but I, oh that's a good shot isn't it 
Well, let's see yeah, where it lands. It's a creative shot. Um, but, um, yeah, good yeah, try. It's, uh, Still it's a lot of work to do. Yeah, it's not a shot that I would have predicted there, but uh, interesting, yeah. Yeah, definitely. He's either got to take a, a pretty tricky putt into the middle or um, thick run through into the middle off the yellow. That's not at all uh, oh fancy well, or screwing right. off the red. None of those <laughs> options is very attractive. There's a, a screwing <laughs> off, the, forget the run through in yeah, the centre. Yeah. <laughs> pot red and, no, and may all screwing off. He's, off. He's, he's screwing off. playing the screw cannon. Oh, screwing, screwing off. off. Yeah, and he's yep. just over And that's a hard yeah, shot. Yeah, hard shot. Hard shot coming fresh onto the table uh, early. So just a, a fairly scratchy opening there from uh, two over 22, but uh, first blood to him. So do you have a feeling, Robbie, at all about how you think this match might go? I think, you know, even though Surav is the top of his powers, I really think that Gilchrist had a tough match yesterday. And... Oh, well, now I'm going to just change my mind. <laughs> <laughs> but he did have a tough match, mm. and it's a lot of the time you'll see in tournaments that you want one tough match to kick on, and then you kick on into top gear, and it feels a bit easier, and you nearly feel destined to win the oh, thing. Okay, that was my yeah. original thoughts, because yep, yep. um, Surav had the easier semi. Yep. But, but saying that, Peter's already missed a couple that he... Mm absolute sitters really yep, yep. to score and you normally pay for that you know yeah, yeah. used to say if I've missed one or two or three shots yeah. in a match well then you probably really don't you can't really complain yeah. if you're going to yeah. lose but it's a long long match yep. so you know that's going yeah. well ahead of ourselves yeah so a good example of that safety first approach by Sura. Then he didn't take any risks with uh, playing on the red. He uh, just uh, m put it straight into Bork, and uh, and uh, he's, he's about to double Bork Peter. Yeah, it's not it's ideal because it's too close to the cushion. He would obviously prefer to have that, uh, you know, further off the cushion. But uh, he just play his ball with a little bit of side back into Bork, and uh, try and leave himself a, probably a run through and off. Yeah, yeah, but it's not it's ideal. Not Peter ideal. will be playing safe, I'd yep, imagine, I here. Think so, yeah. So, interesting, the experience of these uh, these two players. Surav, uh, I think, has only been in one world final, which he won last year. Uh, Peter has been, I think this is 11th. He's won three and been runner-up seven times. So, certainly, Peter has the, uh, the experience. But at the moment in the rankings, we've got uh, the defending champion, Surav, <laughs> up against the world number one in the rankings, uh, Peter, so you know we couldn't have asked for a for, for a higher quality final. It looks this is uh, interesting. He's going to go for this. Looks like, which is a a big shot here. Playing the cannon. Ours is oh. queuing. Oh. No, that that that's a ner That's not thinking right, as far as I'm concerned. Like Peter is a great great player, but I don't think he picked the right shot there. The odds of getting that were uh, quite long, and to set him up. So oh, yeah. he's still got this hard shot, mm. but if he gets it now, he's got position, and he can oh, he can get the cannon too, pot cannon mm. as well. Yeah, that's another option for him. So I think Peter was trying to play that last shot off the uh, off the white, uh, yeah. Robbie. But um, definitely, he he uh, he must have hit it with a little bit of uh, a little bit of side just to bring the ball offline. Then safety first. Uh. Gee, and well, you know, to be honest, this is good for our viewers to see a few people, a few misses. Um, when the only issue with billiards is a great game, but it looks too easy sometimes, and um, it's not looking easy at it's, the moment. It's, it's certainly exactly right, Robbie. It's, uh, they're not making it look easy at all. So, a controlled, a firm shot required here by Peter. Not easy. He's, oh, yes, he's hit that beautifully. Just a bit hard though, the red's gone around the wrong way. Very hard to uh, to hit uh, that shot from that distance and still hit it softly enough to knock the red into the corner. So, uh, yeah, could have uh, easily happened though. Mm. He played it pretty well, so it well, yeah. uh, it's run of the balls, but you mm. know, come on. he's got a the big <coughs> he's got a big white in the corner here, Robbie. So yeah. it looks as though he's having a bit of a lash. Oh, uh, too much. Yep. Yeah, I don't think the angle for the pot was compatible with the angle for the uh, the cannon there. Now he could get a thin mm, cannon mm, and mm, get top very mm, quickly mm. if this if this shot works out. Um, 
I think clean the white, just a bit of a nervous clean yeah. ass. For so while we're having uh, that little break in play, I'll just talk you through the, uh, the semi-final results uh, yesterday. Uh, fantastic semi-final lineup we had with, you know, four of the really, you know, top players in the world, very, very high up in the rankings. Uh, in the in the first semi-final, Sirav Kathari uh, was up against uh, 12 time world champion Mike Russell. Sirav ended up uh, winning that 10, 1,090 to 594 in a truncated match, which uh, Mike Russell conceded, as Robbie uh, referred to before. Sirav with breaks of 128, 195, 205, 175 and 103. So nothing really big there, but very consistent break making. And Mike Russell, 121, 247 and 131. Now, as he hit this hard enough, uh, critical stages in the match here, where once they get in their groove, uh, I think we can look through all the records, but yeah. this is really a big part of this match because oh. it's awkward, both people are struggling. This is like real competitive billiards. Now he's going to play the cannon. He could he could screw in off that red. He could. And, and send it that's, around the that's table. That's actually the right shot. No doubt of that. Yeah, and I think it is. He's and he's oh, lucky he's there lucky, with a double very kiss. Lucky there. He, 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 he made a bit of a hash of that. He's buried the, the yellow, and that red could have gone anywhere on the top cushion, but he's, he's left himself an in off. I'm going to say something as well that, in my experience, the person who starts playing the right shots the first mm -hmm. will also get the advantage. Mm. If they keep trying to slap them round <laughs> to some sort of degree, <laughs> it's, that's a bit... <laughs> That's a bit wild it's statement, it's but a, uh, no, no, but no, exactly in there, mean, like it's there's a, no way. It's a, it's a sign of nerves, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, and mm, uh, mm. the sooner you get rid of mm, those, mm. The, s the better you'll mm, play. Mm. But it takes a bit of guts mm. to play the right shot. No, it does. It's a, it's a, it's a game of courage, uh, billiards, because it does require such uh, finesse, and sometimes you just have to have the coach play a shot, you know, very slowly, or you know, play a little soft screw or something like that to. Um, you know, to just retain position. And you've got to have the courage to take that risk uh, to get the reward of, of good position. So it, because of that, mm. easy, well, that lack of courage, for want of a better mm. word, mm. at the moment, that yellow is in a bad position, mm. so he's got to work harder now. Mm. Um, but he can do it, there's no doubt about that. Yeah, so thick here, just bringing the red up, quite close to the balk line. So now he can move it. Oh, uh, oh, it nearly yeah. went that extra <laughs> few mils. That's that's he, the great he, thing about billiards. Amazing, isn't it? He was lucky there that the iron was on nine and not on ten. Or <laughs> well, the temperature <laughs> just went down one fraction. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> David, you absolutely are a fanatic at this game, <laughs> and the, uh, you know all credit to you, and uh, you're a major uh, influence and on this tournament uh, for getting it here. So well done to you, David. Oh, thank you, Robbie. Uh, you're very kind, but yes, I, it's certainly no doubt that I've been heavily involved in this tournament on the or organising committee and have been involved in about five or six uh, different aspects of it, from the table preparation to the seating set up to the uh, program and uh, the publicity and uh, a whole lot of other stuff as well. But uh, it's been great fun. I've absolutely yeah. enjoyed every minute of it. Oh, he's just snuck through... A, but that is another. That was. That was a fairly yeah. straightforward uh, yeah. shot. He missed it by a long way, players. really, because yeah. he wanted to hit that virtually full. full. Yep. Yep. I mean, you can sometimes go for the edge of the ball, yeah. but not yep. on that occasion. Yeah. Yep. So Peter's jumped out of his chair yeah, there, hasn't he? Though? Yeah. And uh, that could oh, be a vital right. mistake. Yeah. Lovely that was a lovely shot. thin shot there, yeah. wasn't it? Again, yeah. that slow, courageous shot. He he played it beautifully. You've been working here. I've seen you do the lights as well, David. Oh, that's and, right. Um, yeah, I was up on the table hanging the lights yeah. <laughs> uh, a week or so ago. Yeah. Uh, but there's nobody more enthusiastic about billiards than yourself. So I, I think uh, many, many years ago yeah. you got me very enthusiastic yeah. uh, about it, uh, at the yeah. Melbourne University Club. Yeah. So uh, I should say thanks again thanks, personally. I, I should say something uh, funny that uh, Jim Long said to me when I was very young. I was only about 21 or 22. And Jim Long was, uh, you know, a great uh, Melbourne player of the uh, of, uh, previous era. And uh, he said to me, you know, David, I've never met anybody who's keener on billiards than you. 
And I thought that was an extraordinary thing to say because he knew Walter Lindrum. <laughs> <laughs> Rumour has it that Walter Lindrum was pretty keen on billiards. <laughs> well, he might have. Well, to be honest, he didn't play that many tournaments. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, no, I, I echo that. If you don't believe me, you just ask my wife. She, she will confirm <laughs> that I'm a, I am a, a She told, a she told me the other yeah. day, she said she hasn't seen you for a few months. Yeah. Hardly. She's only ever seen me in bed, really, because I've been uh, running around. All like right, you don't have to go there, but, David. But, Thanks a lot. Back to the billiards <laughs> now. So uh, Peter now in good position. He's uh, got the white on the top cushion. Uh, and easy and off the red. And he's just bring that in out of pork uh, to bring the red to the other side of the table for a... Uh, a cannon to bring them down to the top of the table. That's, that's beautifully played, that's isn't it? That's a lovely shot. Yeah. Perfect. You yeah. couldn't put it there yeah. better yeah. with your hand. Yeah. That's right. So, but so, uh, it's all changed, I think, mm. straight away now. Mm. A lot of body language in this mm. game. Mm. Um, as soon as he, Katari missed that, mm. Peter was out very mm. quickly. Mm. And so oh, that's a bit unlucky. Yeah, just a bit of an unfavourable the, kiss there. He's got a run through, I think. He's got a run through. Oh. Has he? Cushion, yeah. Cushion first. That's a good example of the sort of the uh, the risk factor. You know, there may yeah, be a no, he's going off the, the side. cushion. Yeah, yeah well, it's yeah. not as easy as no. I thought. He might, if he plays the run through, he is this. going back yeah. to the initial yeah. idea. Yeah, that yeah, was the shot. Beautifully played too. Bit of right hand side on that one, Robbie, just to make sure the. Uh, that the white cleared the red? Is yeah, that the, is that yeah, the idea of that side? The side a fraction. Yeah. Just no. throw the white a little bit wider off the cushion to make sure it didn't uh, collide with the red. But, you know, it's the little things. You know, he looked for a minute to mm. play the other shot. Mm. I tell you what, when he was when he's on a break of 280, he wouldn't be looking the other way. Mm. He, uh, but looks a lot more comfortable now and... It's all, it's all about who yeah. settles, and yeah. now he's playing the right shots. So I was just uh, mentioning before the semi-final results. In the other semi-final, there uh, was a cracking match between uh, Peter and uh, David Corsier. Uh, David Corsier, who's been uh, really the the, the 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 best break maker here this week. He's had, he had uh, um, four breaks over 400, and uh, also a 655 in the World Open, which is a warm-up event. Um, so, but just he wasn't quite able to produce those big breaks in the semi-final against uh, Peter. He, he had 119, 191, 127 uh, to Peter's 101, 207, 123, 305, 137, and 130, 174. So, as I read out those breaks, you would think that was a, a comfortable win to Peter. Uh, but in fact, the scores were, were pretty close: 1183 to 1023. So, a, a tough fighting. Um, win there by Peter in his last break uh, 174 he uh, the first hundred of that he never had position once he was uh, he was uh, you know they just weren't running for him and uh, he ground out uh, a very good uh, break under under adverse circumstances you know it was a break he needed to make wow well here's a bit of luck have a look at that yeah. he's he's missed the pot and look where the red is it's virtually mm. a half ball mm. it's well actually it's a bit harder it's a bit lower, and the white's a bit mm. higher. Uh, the yellow's a bit higher, but so he's got stun, a chance. Stun can it? Yeah. No, uh, I didn't even need to stun it. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I think he did need to stun it. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Or mm. more pace, yeah. at yeah. least. Yeah. It's but just didn't need it low enough either. He wanted to right. sort of leave a half ball yeah. in off. Yep. Game of fractions, but this is good stuff actually. I'm enjoying <laughs> this when it's uh, when it's like this. Mm. It's all very well to see the you know reeling off three and four hundred breaks, but uh, yeah, uh, this is um, this could be very interesting too. I was and when you come back mm. into mm. the match mm. at the start, you have sometimes you have a few preconceptions mm. of how the table's playing, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it may not be exactly what they're thinking. Uh, it all adds up to showing. Uh, showing the difficulty of the game. Mm. So what do you think, you, what's the shot here, oh, Robbie? What's the, this what's is the, difficult, I, don't, I can't even call it. He might play safe here. No. Oh, he's played a beautiful he's shot. Played yeah, a beautiful that, was a, that was a difficult shot, a little bit thinner than yeah, half ball, I think. quite a bit thinner. And, uh, <coughs> and he's just played that, uh, you know, at the correct angle, but more important, equally as importantly, at the correct pace to bring the, the white yeah. out of balk. So that, a very good shot there by Peter. 
Yeah, interesting what he's doing. He's just in going in, in on the narrow side. To That's not an easy shot either, by oh, the way. Oh, oh. Wanted to hit it one bit softer, but he's still fine. Mm. So critical shot this because he's just got to land softly. Oh no, he's, he's no, playing he's the safety a bit first wide. shot. That's why. Yeah. Yeah, that's why yeah. he wanted to leave yeah. it one bit mm. shorter. So but he's, he's going to try and hit it thick, I suppose, and leave the drop cannon next. Yeah, but is it? Mm, yeah, it'll just be all right. But want to hit a bit thicker again. But just, it's just all good. Just a little bit thicker. It's okay. So I sort of said, uh, Peter, you know, playing in his, I think, 11th final. Uh, someone will correct me on the uh, commentary there if I'm wrong. Um, uh, Peter uh, lives in Singapore, has done for over a decade, and he uh, he travels the world playing uh, playing in tournaments all around the world. He's a frequent visitor to Australia, and he's also uh, plays a lot in Asia. Um, of course, you know, being there, it's a lovely, oh, great camera work there by Dan uh, producer. Just showing uh, that slowly travelling ball spinning beautifully into the pocket. Great work, Dan. Yeah, well, he's, he's he's probably the most match fit player. He travels to all the tournaments. Plus, he's got the uh, Asian Sea Games and so forth. So, and that's got to help. Um, a lot of other players don't play as many tournaments, and there's nothing like match play. I can vouch for that. I had no idea what I was doing this week, but. Um, so he's got that advantage. The Indians play quite a lot, but no more than uh, this man here, no, Peter I think he, he probably plays in more tournaments than anyone, e even more than Jason, if, if that were possible. <laughs> <laughs> Jason Colbrook, the, the chairman of uh, WBL, lives in, uh, uh, lives in Melbourne, but uh, he's uh, a great ambassador for the game, gets uh, all over the world playing in, uh, in England. He plays in Asia. Oh, he wanted to catch the other draw there, I think, on that red. Yeah, I yes. oh, just hit it softer. Oh, hit it softer, yeah. yeah. I was thinking the better, yeah. not the better shot, but it would have been safer if yeah. he tried to push it down to the bottom. Brought it, uh, maybe over possible. The pocket, yeah. yeah, that never works for me, Robbie. <laughs> okay. When I try and push it over the ball pocket, but uh, for a better player, it might. Oh, yeah. well, that so centre pocket's small. Yeah, that is. But so that's uh, a little see bit what wide. He this one, I think he's going to have to throw this wide with top spin, a bit of right hand side. Oh, yes, he's played that pretty well. But yeah, right now he's going. trusting to luck a little bit. Oh. And uh, that's Ooh, not bad. That's a, that's a stroke of luck. That's just oh. come back into uh, into range. Yeah, for, uh, but have a, a good look. There. He can get a cannon yeah. and yep. just get that yep. just opponent's ball out of yeah. ball. Yeah. As long as he gets it. Yep. But could have been worse. Mm. The other thing is he's got a big ball here too. Because if he misses this off the... Uh, off the directly uh, he had a chance of getting off the cushion that's a yeah, great shot yeah all about the pace yeah, there yeah. to mm. leave another shot yeah. nice shot again a good example of, uh, of uh, the current role of courage in billiards you've got to have to have the courage to play slowly enough that it introduces an element of risk but at the same time it uh, gives you a better chance of having uh, a, a le leaving yourself a shot afterwards so here we are we've been Playing now for nearly 25 minutes, and the score's uh, 52 to 67, which just <laughs> shows how um, how uh, what a careful start, you know, both these, these well, players have made. Not just you know. careful, David. Yeah. If you're not playing that well, mm. you can't score fast. Yeah. It's mm. simple as that. Mm. Um, yeah, so people, you know, think, oh, these guys go along at five minutes 100, and they should be 300 each. And it's not like that now. This is a the title on the line, and uh, oh. Oh, look at Ooh, well, that was lucky too, you know, because even though he didn't get the fluke, he, he knocked the the red could easily have trapped in the jaws there. And, and mm, left the correct, they have an easy shot, but so uh, he, 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 it's just gone out into a bit of a dead zone. And uh, we were really talking before much. about the pots, mm, mm. they're the sort of things if you're not playing well, mm, he's missed mm. a pot there, yeah. trying to work the ball around the table, but mm. normally would get that. Yep. So yes. now, well, the fancy shot is a screw back in off, mm -hmm. and it's really the right yeah. shot. But he um, may have a, he's got an in off. He in looks in like pork, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he could develop the could play mm -hmm. a cannon off the red, yeah. develop it, yeah. and put all the balls in the right position in one shot. But he's not even thinking about it. No, 
Safety, I'd say. Off, off Safety is not think? Right, is yeah, I don't know. Okay. Must be we'll going off. It's quite difficult yeah. to tell. Check side, just bringing that ball across. Oh, so close. That was a good, you know, again, a courageous shot, just playing at that dead slow pace. Yeah. He needed to keep the yellow out, out of pork. Um, he had another mm, thought, too, that yeah. he'd leave it in the jaws, maybe. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, it's, a, but you know, he's, uh, he's mm. tried a nice shot there, mm. just didn't pay off. So Peter will no doubt pot the white here, come down to this end of the table and he'll be looking to play safe. Yeah, uh, he didn't want this either, I'll this tell is, you that, yeah. David. Uh, this is a not a nice <laughs> pot. He wanted to go back up the table, go mm. in off or just send a safety shot. So yep. he's having a look at this. What's yep. he doing? Yeah. I think he has to go for it nearly. There is there is a he safety. Might be trying a double ball yeah, here. Yeah, he's, there is. It can go wrong. Oh, that's a very... Ooh, no, too hard. Out, isn't it? Too hard. Uh, I hope I called it right. Yeah, just... <laughs> right. Good call, Robbie. <laughs> It's, this wouldn't be your home table at your home club, uh, would it? That you're oh, very I'm not familiar really with, Robbie, <laughs> at all. I wish you could. I wish I was. No, you. This has got a new type of cloth. It's recovered. We don't. It's, I do know this table, mm. but not not well this week. Mm. So it was just a a good guess. Mm. But now a shot that he shouldn't have, one way or another. You could look at it. So at least he's got a shot, Surav. They'll both be thinking now. We've both had, you know, we've had chances. We better start taking them. Gathering shot here. No, it doesn't like that doesn't either. Like that. No, he's going back. I think yeah. his original idea was to play a, 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 I think he might be, well, I don't, I, no, can, I think I he wants to go in off. I think the re gathering shot's better if it comes yeah. off. Yeah, he's not sure. Just doesn't like that one either. No, this is the shot, even though we're not sure where it's going to land. But in two shots, you can move everything mm. or play some nurseries. We haven't got, I don't think many people will play nurseries this week. But <laughs> No, we haven't seen that at all. Now, this is all about the pace. It's nearly well, the, a the, song. The, but the, the, the pace is good. Yeah, yeah it's, it's just that all right. Is good. He's, he's quite close to the uh, to the yellow, but uh, it, no, no, it should be no problem at all for these top players to just run through that with a, a nice shot. No, he's played that beautifully. Yeah, got the ball out mm. of Bork there, mm. lovely, and he's got a slight angle on the red. He could maybe, mm. well, he can do that, mm. or he could stun it up mm. to the centre pocket. Mm. So for the uh, the viewers' benefit, the uh, the cloth we're playing on uh, here for the World uh, Billiards Championship at the RECV Club this uh, this week is a, a new cloth from Strawn, the uh, the famous uh, and traditional English cloth suppliers. It's called Strawn Superfine. It's a, a lighter cloth and has been used in recent years um, for both uh, for billiards and snooker. Uh, most of the billiards in recent years has been played on the. the Strawn 6A double one thirty ounce cloth. Um, wow. Yeah, well, there. Oh, look at that. Just to make it a bit more awkward, but you know, he didn't leave the ball in the right position. You could mm. see from here it was he didn't hit pot that mm. red mm. and move the cue ball up the table far enough. But uh, you now Peter loves this sort of mm. play up the top if he can. Ooh, oh, I've really mozzed him. <laughs> wow, <laughs> I would oh. never expect that. Uh, that was pretty thin. I mean, he had to get a lot of side on. I just yep. don't know that he got f maximum side on. No, he didn't, on that but one. he was going yeah. for the edge. Yeah, and yeah. Fair yeah. play to him there. Absolutely, he, yes. He won absolutely. The, he, yep. I think yep. he won the tourna uh, the match last <laughs> night that I, I mm -hmm. called mm -hmm. when he played a beautiful in off cushion first, but the yellow was way away from the pocket yes that was a good and one that I was, was a watching and, that yeah and uh, i think that's what won in the match mm. and they're the sort of things but yeah mm. he should have really got that he didn't need to hit it really thin because at no. the, uh, he just had to hit it softly and he's yeah. either going to have a an in off or a um uh, a pot and of course the, the yellow was the white ball was was in the vicinity as well so uh, the, uh, Worst case, it would have been he left himself a cannon. Uh, so Rev just 
pointing the red twice there. After two pots off the spot, the red goes up to the centre centre of the table. He's just asking the referee to uh, Kim Ivet to respot that ball to make it so, make sure it's on the um, on the table. And that's a classic way of getting top of the table. This mm. is the the perfect way, really, if you can play this next shot, push mm. the red over the centre pocket. It's risk free. Here's a bit of a surprise, uh, Robbie, that he's going on this side of the table. Yeah, it's the closest side. Very good pick up. Uh, what I mean by that is the red's going to get closer to the yellow, but it's going to it's it's sliding this table, so it's uh, it won't go there. Oh, it nearly went there, it but it did. didn't. Yeah, yeah, oh, I well. would have played it the other side. Yeah, I think he wanted. To, uh, I would have thought, as a you know, a mere amateur, that he would have wanted to have the red on the same side of the table as the uh, yellow, to oh, put it in the side and and come down on uh, on the right hand um, side of the table as we look at it. Well, so he's got a, everybody's got a favourite side mm. to play, mm. and he is under pressure. There's mm. no doubt about mm. it. They're not playing freely, mm. Mm. Uh, so he went for that, and he hit it fractionally thin. And uh, that's what he gets, but mm. that's a nice shot. That mm. I think, as long as it doesn't go too no, far, yeah, okay. perfect. That's a that's a con that's a uh, that's a control shot, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, he one. played it's that a, one. It's a you know, it's a, a you're hitting it ball hard, but it's, you still have to hit it with control so that you don't hit it too hard, and you leave the red uh, too far up the table. So. Yeah, that red just straightened up off the top uh, top cushion then. Well, now all he needs is one good pot. Yep. He might want to stun it across to the right-hand side of the table, the mm. cue ball. Uh, but he, he's looking how far. He's not going to do that. He's going to just knock it up. Or is he? He should. It looks straight. And that tells me exactly what you're saying. No risk. Mm. Uh, it's fine here, but the yellow's near the spot. Basically, I don't. Mm. It'll be a great shot to keep this under the parallel line, actually, of the yeah. which he has done parallel line to yeah. the cushion, the red. Yeah, so good, fantastic good, play good, there. Good touch shot that, yeah, especially that was a after half an hour of uh, of you know. Uh, you know, reasonably uh, nervous play. That was a that was a good shot. He wasn't that close to the red either. Mm -hmm. uh, I do like his short bridge. Actually, mm -hmm. it reminded me. I was saying to myself all week I wanted to do that, but I didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> you <laughs> forgot. I forgot basically. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, and it helps yeah. with a faster table mm -hmm. too. I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's interesting. Yeah, I, 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 yes, yeah, interesting tip there for for players. Just you know, if 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 you not quite you know playing as well as you feel you should be just push your hand a little bit closer towards the um, uh, towards the uh, towards the cue ball and um, something's just, disturbing you know, something there's a distraction there in the, in the crowd or something it's the, yeah yeah and oh. I noticed that I didn't want to complain too much but Oh. The lighting, it yep. does reflect off the badges and that. Yes, okay. Something so you'll have to look into, David. So yes, <laughs> when we do this again, we'll make <laughs> yeah, well, sure... You'll have you had a rest we'll for a few the, years, uh, is that right? The don't wear watches. So that's Dennis Coughlin, a stalwart of the no, RACV club. It's the signs uh, as well. Just, uh, standing right. up there, uh, just yeah. acting as an usher. He's been volunteering here all this, yeah, uh, all this week, worker. so he's a great worker for us, uh, Dennis. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Dan's suggesting that uh, he's had a couple of dollars on uh, on Peter Gilchrist. <coughs> so they've got no excuses with the balls here, Robbie. I, uh, we've been supplied with 20 sets of uh, balls by Aramith for this championship, and I personally selected this uh, uh, set myself uh, for the final. I weighed all the sets of balls, and this, this set is accurate, uh, matched to within a tenth of a gram. So how long did that take you to measure all these oh, balls? About half an hour. Oh, yeah, is not that all? Long. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I've okay. got a little set of precision scales and yeah. I just sat down and uh, wrote, the rope, wrote down the weights on, on the boxes as I did it. So there's another example of me being another. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's all right. It's very important to get the right weight, but... Um, Anyway, he's in control. He's now, this is the perfect position for floating white. Uh, and now, the more you play, the easier it looks. But 
He's still got to get in the groove, not totally in it. Let's see yeah. if he can stay there now. Yeah. So the, the idea of this at the very top level is to just milk this position, just gradually uh, you know, move the yellow only a fraction. Uh, that's a bit too far. Doesn't really matter. But if you can uh, you know, milk that half a dozen times uh, towards the top cushion before you play the shot uh, to bring it back up, uh, no. you know, you're getting uh, you know, 40 or 50 points before you have to play the cannon off the top cushion. And the, the, art, of, uh, the art of billiards is, uh, is, is to just keep, uh, keep that right away from the top cushion. Yeah, there was no, uh, there was no risk with that cannon. Um, he, the, when you're in top form, he wanted to hit the yellow more on the other side. Mm -hmm. So he's still a bit careful, as you said. Mm -hmm. That's how he plays, and that was interesting, actually. So he just bounced the white off the top cushion there. Of course, this floating white was your forte, uh, Robbie, and you really uh, became a fanatic about this uh, about this method and uh, uh, really mastered it in your heyday. Uh, you were making huge breaks uh, by this method, and I recall very well in 1998 when you won the IBSF Walter Lindrum Centenary World Championship at the old RACV club in Queen Street. I, I saw you make a 400 break from this position and the object ball never once touched the top cushion. So you never had to play that cannon white to red, uh, which bounces it back off the top cushion. You, oh, you had the balls in, in perfect position the whole way. Wonderful um, break. Actually, I think that break was when I called the foul on myself. Was that it? Do you remember oh, that? I don't remember I doubled, that. Uh, I didn't, okay, you, you doubled I, it. I uh, just touched the... I, I didn't know I'd be, not be making many more breaks like that. I should have kept going. <laughs> but I just touched the white. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so this is a bit more freer. But, you know, it, to be fair, this is no risk. It's fantastic. And then yep. if yep. he keeps going, I think he'll be a bit more precise. But uh, days gone by, if we're talking about it, this is more like what Rex Williams used to play, yeah. floating wider. at not such a precise method and then players have got more and more precise so uh Zverev Kathari now on 94, just had to cross the balk line under the, the balk line crossing rule, which requires the players to cross the balk line between 80 and 100 points in every 100. And uh, he's just going on beautifully. That was a good shot yeah, there because yeah. he's just got enough line yeah. uh, mm. to through to the red. Mm. Yes, I saw Rex, uh, Rex Williams play when he uh, played down in Geelong and uh, defended his world championship against... Uh, against Eddie Charlton, Robbie, and I was very impressed with his play. I saw him make a, a 300 break, as you described, just uh, moving him around a bit. And then later on the same session, he made another 300 using your method, where okay. uh, where you know the, the, the ball just went up and down on that little line. So, you know, he could play you know, both those two different styles of floating white uh, absolutely beautifully, um, and it was a revelation to me. Uh, to see, you know, to see the, the two different styles played so so beautifully uh, in the same session. Yeah, I had a few battles with mm. Rex myself, but I didn't see that because mm. he's a bit older. Mm. Uh, and he, he stopped. He, he played professional snooker mm. uh, as I did, mm. and uh, he concentrated more on snooker and business for quite a while. Mm. But there was always an argument in England when I was <laughs> there. Yeah. Yeah. Is is Rex Williams better than the great Norman Dagley, who was an amateur, mm, mm. and he wouldn't turn professional. Yep. Uh, so that was always uh, a good talking point. Yeah, Norman was a, was a great player, but uh, he didn't turn professional until later in his career because he, he liked the idea of a, a free trip every two years overseas to play in the IBS <coughs> World Championship, which he won three times and, and was always thereabouts you know, during his career in that uh, tournament. Um, if he turned professional, then uh, he would have been funding himself, and there wasn't a lot of money in it. So his take was, well, I'd rather have these free trips and uh, you know win some world championships and have a good time. And in fact, in those days, really, you know, the standard of amateur um, billiards was on a par with the, the standard that, uh, that that 
uh, you know, Rex, who was the world champion, was playing it. You're, you're starting to sound like this argument that they were having. <laughs> I mean, uh, to be fair, though, I, I think the pockets weren't standardised mm. then, and I'm sure the professional pockets were sh tighter. Tighter, yeah. Mm. Um, so hard to compare, yeah, but course, both great yeah. players. Yeah, they were, they were. No, I, I, I saw Norman Dagley play a number of times. He was a beautiful player. Rex Williams, really impressive. And uh, what impressed me about Rex was uh, how creative he was. Um, you know, he, he would occasionally just throw in a, a shot which uh, you go, oh, wow, you know, um, right. a bit like uh, David Corsier uh, in a way. Oh, really? But yet his reputation, uh, completely unlike that, has just a stayed boring, you know, steady, uh, steady type of a player. Mm. So, speaking of David Corsier, what perfect timing. He's yeah. just uh, about to step into the commentary with Peter Tankard. So, thank you, Robbie. Uh, great to talk. We're just in an interesting stage of the game here, and we're about to hand over to our new commentary team of Peter Tankard and David Corsier. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm uh, joined here with the great David Corsier, um, who had a battle against the man sitting in the chair, Peter Gilchrist, last night uh, in one of the great matches. Morning, David. Or good you. afternoon, Dad. Thank you, Peter, for having me. It's, it's wonderful to be here. I'm sure you wish that you were out there. <laughs> Itching. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think it's a bit becoming a bit of a dangerous part of the game, this. He looks like he's settled down now. You mentioned to me earlier that this first session is a time that you can stamp your authority on the match. Yeah. Uh, Peter probably won't be thankful I remind him that beat Peter in the final in Leeds. Uh, they say the match isn't won. I lost in the first session, but that day it wasn't. Sometimes you can, if you can lose by six or seven hundred, it's mm. almost impossible to get yes. it back. And if someone loses this session heavily, it's going to be tough to get it back. I've heard it said, and I don't know whether you agree, that you can't win in the first session, but you can lose in the first session. Exactly, that's what I'm just saying. I don't saying. know how that works, given uh, there are only two outcomes. Yeah. Um, but what, what, what do they mean when they say that? Well, you can't win it in the first session, but you can certainly lose it. Like, if you lose by seven or 800, you've more or less, well, not well, lost it, but definitely. Hasn't your opponent won it then? Like, I mean, well, there's only suppose, binary yeah, outcomes yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. But he's starting to look like he's settled down now, because it all looked a bit edgy the first half an hour, Ooh, 20 minutes. That's, that's that a fairly poor shot. Lined it up. He'd be very annoyed. Looks, looks and upwards to the stands. I think it's a complete cover, that. Just uh, while like sort of contemplates, can we uh, send a big shout out to his dad, Manoj, who yep. I'm sure is listening. Uh, you should be very proud of your son this week. He has been a fine gentleman uh, and a very worthy uh, bearer of the title of world champion. I think everyone would agree on that. Shake of the head. Big shot coming up. What what do you play here? You'd like to think you can get it off the back cushion here, but with the yellow being just in front. Yes. And if he misses, he leaves Peter plumbing. That very good shot. Good shot. <laughs> Screw pot. Screw cannon, red off the top cushion. Bring up and down. Ideally looking for the red to be somewhere over the corner bag just catch either below or above the yellow just a flick off it there you go almost perfect <coughs> could, have been, could have been better yeah it's just that last kiss Turn a little was a little flick off the red i think try and get it on the other side of the yellow and he's got it back mm. 
In the background there, Peter was raising his eyebrows and stretching his eyes as if he looked a little tired. I, don't, I hope we haven't worn him out. <laughs> <laughs> I think he may never recover. Yeah. I thought he might have played the in off there. Mm. Looking like he put the yellow. Um. Mm. We can play it now. <laughs> Hopefully trying to get the yellow towards the drop cannon position here, I think. Is this as far as you've ever travelled for a billiards tournament? Ever. It's the farthest I've ever been. Has it been worthwhile? Yeah, it's been wonderful. I mean, you'd prefer to be sitting there now, but uh, no. the rest of the tournament's gone well for uh, you. I've won one semi-final, the other host of big breaks. Yes. Hopefully neither of these are going to spoil my day and take my eyes break off me either. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if Peter does a, that, I'll be very upset. You posted a monster one. break in the World Open. Yeah, it was nice. Uh, and, and unfortunately, we don't have that on video, mm. but uh, the reports from the Arrowville Club where it was made uh, was that you knocked in 655 in 37 minutes. Yeah. Nice. Did you feel like you were flying? Yeah. You, yeah, you did? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. As, uh, do you, do you, have you... Did you, have you, did you feel like you've made a faster break than that? I mean, uh, you're famous for knocking yeah. them in quickly. I've made a faster break, but I just felt more like very fluent and I don't know, I just felt at home straight away. It's a lovely club. Yeah. The tables yes. are very nice. Just found, I just felt like I found my feet straight away and I feel like yes. I've been hitting big breaks all week. Yes. It's been a very good these experience. These cloths have been a little bit slicker than Yarraville, I think. There's I quite like them. I, I know I've heard people saying this and that about them, but like... I don't know, I quite like them. I think it's only the side cushion on the bot line crossing you have to really like sort of be careful with. It's yes. sort of, when you hit it on the side, instead of it just like, arc, it sort of arcs round, instead of it just follows its true line, but right. there's, no, there's, no, there's no bad so comment on it. So flattens it out yeah, a bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you probably just lose the cue ball a bit. But I've noticed some of the players are now electing to do, do the blue spot, like the snooker players do. And then I watched Surav there. He yes. doesn't go all the way around the table now. He sees where he needs to be and yes. leaves himself well shot. So he's guaranteed I saw that. the position. I saw, I saw he uh, stopped between the uh, centre spot mm. and the pyramid spot yeah. on a cannon um, yeah. in a previous match. Mm. He's done it earlier on in this game. And yeah. I, think that's, uh, I think he doesn't want to take a risk of hitting the ball too hard. He yes. has to get it all the way yes. around. He's more doing his percentages. Or even going off in this yeah. corner. Yeah, that's what a lot of people the, have the, done. Uh, top in corner pocket. Potty and come back over, I would have think, here. Yeah. Oh, it's not got... Mm. He's a solid pot, oh, Sora. He won the, uh, he won the uh, snooker that was associated with the billiards event here in June. That was at Yarraville, wasn't it? That was yeah, at Yarraville. Yeah, I've seen all the information and, um, about him. And I think that was a bit of a surprise for some of our local snooker players that... Uh, uh, a guy that they, they might have heard of for billion <laughs> should come in and <laughs> snaffle their prize money. That won't have gone down very well, <laughs> that, will it? Well, <laughs> I think it earned a little bit of respect for the billiards players, to be honest with you. They're like, who is this guy? He's a very solid snooker player, though, and yeah, he's seen him play. Yeah. Bot line crossing yet again, like I said. Now, there you go. That's what uh, you you might call a uh, a snooker player's bot line crossing. I know yeah. Pankaj plays this one quite a bit. Depends on what he Short does here. The spot. He may try and get on the other side of the yellow, back to the top. No, he's gone the he's other coming way. coming back this way. And drop, again, he hasn't panel. brought it all the way back. No. He's he just quite seem content to, to leave it with a, a yellow loser. Good enough yellow here, and he can be on the drop cannon and get help straight back. On to the 200. Peter Looking scratching the chin. <laughs> Little shake of the head. <laughs> Trying to get himself up. It's a long way to go, though. Long way to go. Long way to go. And this will not be the only big break that we see in this contest. Perfect. Plain ball here. Trace a right-hand side out. Play just to drag the yellow over a bit. Almost perfect. Depends if that Tough red pot, pot though. Yeah, it depends if that red pots. The yes. red pots it can just pop up. If it doesn't, he'll have to come back over. He's playing for the enough. Yes. <laughs> yeah, quite a conservative approach here from mm. Sora. 
I think I would have chose to play off the yellow there. And then you've got the drop cannon. Mm -hmm. That's what I'd have been looking at, but as a lot of people tell me, I'm quite unorthodox. <laughs> you, uh, <laughs> let, let me be just another one that tells you you're quite unorthodox. You have your own style. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it works very, very effectively for you, and you've obviously developed... Uh, an expertise in recovery shots that we've never seen before. Uh, the other player who's very unorthodox who's played here, I don't know whether you saw any of him, is Pork Sa from uh, yeah, I've Myanmar. Seen him. I've seen him play in Myanmar last year in the IBSF. Uh, he's very impressive. Very, very impressive. And, and a, an array of shots that you won't find in any textbook. Yeah. I think he must come from a three-cushion background, does he? Because I think he so. seems to leave two, three and four cushion cannons almost intentionally. He just doesn't care where Superb the ball's Superb cueist. I yeah. watched him in Myanmar. I think he played Rob All in an opening game. Last year it was 500 up and he's made a, like a 180 followed by a 170. And to look at him you think he doesn't, look, he, he doesn't he look at cueist though. He like, does not look like a... No. Uh, no, he just looks like someone that's just like, I don't know, just turned up. But like Walked in off the street. Yeah, yeah superb player. Yeah. And, and the table craft is just and players from Myanmar are very dangerous. So. Yes, very, very dangerous. dangerous. And I think it's been a, a big uh, wake-up call this tournament where we, for the first time mm. in many, many, many a long year, uh, had uh, the best players from what might be considered to be two camps, uh, WBL and IBSF, yeah. playing in the same competition. And uh, quite a revelation, I think, for a lot of the WBL players as to just how good these guys have become, developing pretty much on their lonesome uh, in Asia. In fact, in many ways, uh, this, this has been a, a kind of a uh, almost an Asian type uh, competition. Mm. But two guys here, Peter Gilchrist now residing in Singapore, and Saurav Katari, of course, representing India. Uh, it's been a, a, a tremendous. Uh, uh, improvement in the game that all these players are playing together again. It's superb that everyone's come together for what yeah. you can call like a, a, a proper specialist world championship. Oh. And, and, we, and we've had the greats uh, mm. in attendance. Nobody could argue that whoever wins this is yeah, a worthy story. world yeah. champion. Yeah. You've had Pankaj Advani here. Uh, you've had Mike Russell here. Uh, you've had the great David Causier here, hmm. legend of the game. Hmm. So, uh, yeah, no matter who wins this final, they've had to beat the best of the best to be here. Yeah. So we started with 60 players, took two players from each group through to the knockout stage and then knocked out uh, a further eight. Eight were promoted through to the uh, last 16 uh, originally and then there was a playoff for the further eight spots to make the last 16. By the time we got to the last 16, uh, we had all eight tables going here at the RACV club uh, in Melbourne and you clearly had the 16 world's best players. I forgot to mention Robbie Foldvari, former great coming out of retirement, made the last 16. What a series of matches that was. Uh, where Saurav uh, beat his countryman Pankaj Advani. And you made an observation about Pankaj's day. Yeah, he, was, well, he won't see many times Pankaj losing twice in a day. Yeah, so he lost once to you in the group stage, mm -hmm. and then he lost again later the same day to Saurav, who you're looking at now. Saurav put 700 points on him in the first uh, Very impressive. First hour, and there was just no coming back from that. He's in total control here. Yes. So I think Saurav has well and truly established himself in the last two years as, uh, if not the, then one of the leading players from India. Totally agree. Yep. Round the table here. Yeah, that's, I'll be surprised what he plays here because he generally doesn't go all the way around on this shot. That's Didn't a great need the shot. Line crossing, no. but uh, spot on. But in fact, played it for positional purposes anyway. It's going strong at the moment. Two five one. Nervous start here, David, for both players. 
yeah, it was. Uh, I don't know, maybe, especially on Peter's point of view, playing late last night. You know, like, you, you know it's a long game and you don't want to, like, sort of give an inch, but you, I always think it's better to start well than to have to sort of, like, regroup and go again. I like to get off to a nice start and then build the platform, really. What's Peter thinking sitting in the chair? Well, I was sat there yesterday, probably in about this position with Peter. <laughs> you just, you so the chair's comfortable? Just yeah, out it's of not bad, yeah. yeah, yeah good, good, good furniture, Peter. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you just have to <coughs> keep strong and think, I will get my chance, and once I get in, you've got to make sure you score. <clears throat> Even when I was 600 down, I still fancied the job. Yes. Which a lot of people find it a bit strange, but you've just got to keep your get ready for any moment when he does miss to be ready to put your game together which doesn't look like it's going to be any time soon the way he's got these no. together little screw cannon I think here yeah. <clears throat> so like Peter you're a product of the Teesside Boys League like so many in fact, uh, three of our four semi-finalists <laughs> were Funny. T-siders. So mm, it's great, isn't it? Well, I don't know if it's great, but yeah. it's great. It's yeah. great uh, <laughs> for Middlesbrough. Yeah, I think you guys call it the Borrow. Yeah, yeah. It's very well. It's good for three players out of from the same area come through like that. Yeah, I've said before. I mean, that's not that's not unusual. Uh, I think uh, we had six out of eight of the quarter finalists. Uh, a couple of years ago and uh, uh, not unusual to find three out of four semi-finalists mm. from the town of Middlesbrough often with uh, uh, a population I think 110,000 or something like that <laughs> yeah. uh, against the Republic of India population 1.1 <laughs> billion there's <laughs> usually a, a, one, one Indian player and, and yeah. three guys from Middlesbrough <laughs> but uh, ob obviously the junior coaching program there was just it's phenomenal. Phenomenal. That's what everyone done, like, yeah. from where we lived. That's all what everyone wanted to do was play billiards, really, at that age. Really? Some people find that a bit strange, but it's just that's what we all done. And it's obviously worked out quite well for us. Sure. And, uh, and was there one driving force, a, a person or a group of people that... Uh, really created and yeah, kept the, the Teesside Boys League Yeah, going. there was a couple of people that were just like the stalwarts behind it. But uh, just like what a lot of the younger players did, if you know what I mean. That's what, yes. that's what we all wanted to do, really. So there was just an expectation growing up that you would be <coughs> playing billiards at some stage? Yeah, like Peter's slightly older than everyone else. And when I was playing, it was like yes. everyone looked up to like Mike and Peter because they were the best two players and... I suppose they're driving force behind a lot of people playing in that area, really. I was going to ask you about that. Um, you, 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 you pump in some giant scores against players. Uh, statistically... Oh, oh that's a terrible. Oh, that's a terrible. Oh, that's a terrible. Top of the table, that's a missed opportunity. It could be a massive turning point, that. Yes. He needs to score something quite heavy here. I think it'd be quite deliberate for the next three or four shots here, just making sure there's no mistakes, especially the situation of the match. Yes. White ball not in ideal position. No, he probably needs to work play a little drop bit. cannon and probably look up going in off the white. Yes. The shot after this. So white cushion red. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. Seven. Stop white. Probably okay. a little. He's all right. Enough. A far, but bit of slow screw. Bit thin. Bring it over the middle. And tricky okay. then because if you haven't been on the table for yes, twenty minutes, right. half an hour, it's so easy just to catch them either a bit too thin or a bit too thick. So now he's got uh, drop a standard drop cannon position. Probably nice for him to get to the top of the table. We're not having much table time and get his queuing going. Balls <coughs> come together. It's not the 
best, to be honest. Now, just can he? Can he? I know he's got long arms, but even he can't reach that without. I a don't rest. think he can. I think can, I don't, I'm not too sure from the position there. He can get the cannon off the red without like like a slow screw. He might have to push a red in and out of bark. I think. Yes, you're there right. You go, great shot. Just doesn't want that red to drop in. Perfect. Yes. Yeah, left the thing coming. Maybe. Just to move no. the white off the cushion. No, he's no, just directed the red. <coughs> he's probably looking to leave the in off the shot after this. Yeah, that's looking at. Looked like he was sizing it up. Looking for a spot on the cloth that his yellow ball will sit on. Yeah, that's why he's playing drop can on the next shot. Just trying to keep everything simple at the moment. Straight up and down the line of the table, it's about pace control. Oh, oh no, he's, he's elected to play in hand first and then try and control this one with a thickish white. This one's a little tricky. I go in and out with this. I oh, know he's just played it dead weight. That's about perfect. Yeah. So now he can get it genuinely behind the spot. You've seen how uh, exacting these top players are if the balls aren't right. They'll break it down and start again. I think that's there or thereabouts. Yeah, ready. Yep. Well played. Very close. Nice pot of the red. Screw back, I would imagine. It'll be almost ideal position. Mm, stuns up. Obviously going to flick off the front face of both yeah. of these balls. Let the red just oh, no. pop out Push the other through. side. I heard Mike Russell saying that there are only six shots at top, plus variations. Is that how you see it's it? Not the way I play, is it? Sorry, <laughs> it's not the way I play, is it? <laughs> <laughs> you mean no, normal absolutely. players? Ah, <laughs> 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 uh, yeah. There's not many, is there? If you think about it, it's just like it's all just about close cue ball control, isn't it? You keep the if you're on the red, you shouldn't really be moving like yes. really that far. I was just wondering if that was a Middlesbrough thing where where you kind of uh, if you like, uh, uh, figured out six shots and variations, whether that was something you, you'd heard before. No, I must have missed that memo, Peter, because I have my own <laughs> version. I think mine's about 15. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's 1,015 at least. <laughs> You, you, oh, if you you're think about it, the most creative player in. If business. you think about it, when you're at the top, you're just doing. It's like very easy to do, isn't it? But it's just like having the knowledge to know exactly where you need to be. Yes, that's all it is. So I would imagine in the pot, this come off the side cushion with the right hand side, follow it through, and back over the other side, and then it'd be right behind the white. Oh, he's, Ooh, come he's low. caught that too much. Come low. He's covered the spot there, and he been very fortunate if he hasn't. You see Kim spotting the balls from uh, on the side here, uh -huh. a little unusual, but yeah. that's because she has a respect for our camera angles, for you, the viewers. We have uh, some tape marked out on the floor, uh, telling us, telling the referees we're not to get in our camera lines. Very good, I've never seen that before, I'm out. Yeah. Brilliant. So they're all aware of that. Peter hasn't really got control just yet. He just seems to be being concentrated and just being very deliberate in, like I said at the beginning of the break, just not missing. I think he realises it's a yes. big visit this. If he was to miss now and Surav has got a minimum of a 200 lead. Yes, and, and could then be the dangerous. opportunity to add more. Yeah, yeah. Every point you score is a point your opponent mm. isn't yeah. scoring. So it's almost like a, a, a double effect. And I think that's one of the reasons that in billiards especially, that the scores can be massive on yeah. the for and against. One player will yeah. dominate the other player, both in time and point score. Particularly true in a time match. 
Be looking to get this white right behind the spot, I think, and pinning top of the table down now. Cause a couple Does of goals he have to play side to do that? Uh, from that angle, just a trace of right-hand side, I would think. Yeah, that's about... Oh, still not perfect. A little... A little come off, cannon off the red with a bit of right-hand side, a bit of, a bit of slow screw. And it could be perfect after this, if he catches it right. It's a great shot. So he used the jaws to trap the yeah. ball there. Still not perfect, because... He was hampered in his queuing. Mm. He's elected to take the sixth shot off that, which <laughs> is safer. Yeah. Left him in prime position, to be honest. Because there's plenty of drag on this, and he could be plumbing. There you go. Perfect. Probably looking to get behind the white, to be honest, to promote. Get the white off the cushion. Does he have the angle for that? From that. If, if, he, no. if he doesn't have it there, he'll pot the red, I would imagine. Screw back a bit more, and then he can just get under it with, a, with some right, some side. Well, he's not like playing he's that. Yeah. Now. I'm surprised. Again, he'll have to come up high if he plays another, the red. I think another cannon. Another screw cannon. Yeah. There you go. Now he's That's right. in a good position now. On and off the cushion. Yeah. Probably a visit Peter needed the way the game was started because yes, he, he's very it, yes. tentative. Very tentative start. He'll be feeling a little bit better mm. now. He's uh, up to 75 and still going. He's not yet playing with any fluency or at the speed no. that he's most comfortable. Uh, do you oh, see that in that shot? There. He's just not settled at the moment, I don't think. Left with what could be a tricky red pot to the middle. I think he'll probably play the screw cannon. Either the screw cannon or the stun off the red, sending the red up and down to try and bring it back over this corner bag, which would probably be a percentage because if he doesn't get the red right, he's probably going to have caught the, the white to have left the yes. enough. Yes. I would have thought. Looks like he's fancying the pot. That's true. That's <laughs> <a> tricky. <laughs> tricky. <laughs> At least with a stun cannon, mind. you've got an, like, an, or you've got an option of like if you catch the red, perfect, and get it off the bag, great. Yeah. He's, pl well, he's playing, he off playing off the white, here? playing screw the screw cannon. cannon off the white. Not comfortable with any of these. No. I find the stun, stun the red up and down would be probably my choice here. There you go. If he's got the pace right, that's perfect. And even if the red's not right, he's on. He's, he's got to run through it off. White. He may play the run through and off the white anywhere. So that red's gone quite close to the cushion now, which I mean could make the next visit a bit harder. Well, you see there intentionally broke it down. He's not happy with... He wants that white directly behind the spot and he's prepared to play them in the open to get it there. So run for in off the he's white. He's looking probably for a little drop cannon here. Possibly. No. Not yet. Not yet. That's why it would be ideal, You're looking forward to promote that white. The red must be okay. Looks like a forcer here. Bring the red in, uh, bring the red in and out of ball. He'd be already thinking also as well. Uh, a, little a little kiss here mm, might that help. That wasn't the greatest, hurt. to be honest. No, that has hurt. He'd already be thinking about the ball line crossing as well, because he's not really yeah. in an ideal position to be no. going through. Thick off the white. The other side, I would imagine. He catches the red right. Does he risk potting the white? He does from there, yeah. From where he's placing it, is he not playing? I think it looks like a stun. No. He's, he's well under it, that. He's left Surav plumbing. Prime. He's actually all the left the position <coughs> that he's been trying to get. Yeah. He's left as a walk-up start to Sora. He seemed to so struggle all the way through that break. I don't he know did, about you, he Pete. He, he didn't did. look like he was comfortable at all. No. I think he's still shell-shocked from uh, having to defend the castle against you last night. Well, 
<laughs> Can't we blame me for that one? <laughs> Dangerous part of the game now. So Ralph's what? About just short of 200 in front. Yes. Feels I mean, to get a visit here. In fairness, we're only one hour into a oh, five-hour match. But uh, this is a time that you can stamp your uh, authority yeah. on the match and uh, put your opponent under a lot of pressure. The results from last night, for those of you who have not yet had a chance to catch up, uh, were that Surav Qatari got through to this final. Uh, got through to this final by defeating Mike Russell, 1,090 to 594. And in fact, that was a concession. Uh, Mike conceded with 45 minutes left on the clock. Not something you see an awful lot of in billiards, but the reality was it didn't make a whole lot of difference. Mike was at a point in the game where he had lost interest, um, didn't feel that he could produce his best, and the match had degenerated into really a one-sided contest. So Mike conceded that point. Uh, it didn't affect uh, Surav's opportunity to make a thousand break, for which we have a special prize here. Surav acknowledged that he couldn't have made a thousand in that 45 minutes that was left. And from a spectator point of view, they got to abandon a match in which one player had lost interest. Turn around, up the other end of the room was a fabulous ladies uh, final, uh, world championship final, where Anna Lynch defeated Judy Dangerfield 240 to 204 in a hotly contested uh, match. Uh, and so, so people got uh, a double bonus there. It was like uh, semi-finals day at Wimbledon. So the women's final and the men's semi-final on simultaneously at either end of the room. He's Anna was them. out celebrating last night. He's played the percentage one again. He doesn't seem to be very keen on getting the... Like, I don't know, it's coming right down. I think a lot of players would have elected to try and get as near the red yes. as possible there. And he's, yes. he seems to be quite happy just to leave it a bit short and... Yeah, know, just, just fairly conservative, choice. really. Yeah, yeah, he, had, yeah. he had a certain cannon, but in mm. doing so, he separated the balls. Thought if he'd have come further down, he could have got on the red, behind the red, and then yes. you, you guarantee to be around the floating white area. But mm. if uh, Sorov can put in even a hundred or a double mm. hundred here. Uh, that would be a very telling blow early on in the match. I agree, that's what I'm saying about first session. You say you can't win it in the first session, but if he takes the 400 lead, it's quite difficult to get back. Well, I think uh, you were coming back from more than that last night, yeah, were you not? Yeah, yeah. It's, so, it's, it's possible. So while it's you're advising him that yeah. it, oh, what? They, he can't come <laughs> back. Uh, There's a few misses going on that you don't really see. Yeah. So I have missed two, out, two in offs. That one was a lot more hard than the first one, but... This is what happens in billiards <coughs> and left absolutely nothing on. Yeah. I mean, the, there's always something on. What you do for me, Peter? I'll <laughs> uh, I, I'd be phoning you, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I think Phone Peter, a friend. I think Peter's got to try and push the red safe and put the white safe and try and contain so we'll have for yeah. a couple of visits, I think. Cause well, the what? The opponent's ball is already in a bad spot on the cushion. So, I mean, I think uh, if he pushes the red safe, because I can't, yes. I don't think he'd be trying like a three cushion cannon off this no. the position of the match at no. the moment. I mean, there's a double kiss cannon on, yeah. there's lots of things percentage wise that are on, but they're low percentage. So, push the red and his ball to a safe position, I think, is all he can do. That's what he's trying to do there. Yeah, I don't think, I think he's got it though. I think he's left, so we'll have another opportunity. Shakes his head. Doesn't look far off the half ball in off red, I think. No. Or a slam cannon. Yeah, it could be a force and cannon. I think they stopped the clock. One of the players has left the arena. <coughs> yep, I expect they'll be walking past us in a moment. Can I put 
two off the squad in succession. So while there's a break in play, uh, I thought I would tell you about uh, a very special thing that we've organised for in between the sessions. Uh, some years ago, the ABC uh, here in Australia produced a documentary on the life of Walter Lindrum, and that will be screening at 3 p.m. on the channel here. Uh, it's if you haven't seen it, it's a wonderful uh, exposition of the life of. Uh, the greatest billiards player that's ever been born and a local Australian hero, Walter Lindrum. Uh, very um, poignant, the timing, because uh, uh, Dolly Lindrum, the last of the Melbourne-based Lindrums, uh, died just this year. And uh, we, we have quite a bit happening uh, with, uh, with the, the Lindrum family. Uh, later on this afternoon, uh, Tammy Lindrum, daughter of Horace, uh, will be presenting the Ladies uh, Billiards World Championship Trophy. And uh, if you uh, phone your friends, tell them to turn on at 3 p.m. to see the Walter documentary. And now we're back to the match. Yeah, another miss by Sourav. John Pete, you don't know, because he's swapping over. <laughs> okay, we're giving Dave Causier a rest. We hope to get him back later in the match because his insights are second to none. But we're being rejoined in commentary by Andrew Ricketts, who was in fact Walter's biographer and billiards aficionado. Oh, Peter's missed that one too, and and it seems that every time he misses, he leaves Sora Plum. So 210 points thereabouts in the difference. About to become more. So welcome, Andrew. Thanks, Peter. It's good to be back. Now, how are you seeing the match so far? Here, yeah, I've just come out of the room just a couple of minutes ago. Um, what was the atmosphere inside there? Yeah, it, it's reasonably tense. Um, Cathari made a nice 279, of course, a nice break. Um, Peter probably hasn't quite hit his straps, has, hasn't got a break going and kept it going, but this, this game, like a lot of games, is about momentum and it can change very quickly. It can only take one bad shot and and you're out or a one bad shot by your opponent and you're in. So it's delicately poised. There's a long way to go. Now Sorov is having to reach and stretch to reach this one. Uh, Peter at close to six foot six. Uh, he can reach well past that uh, side cushion. In fact, he can he can bridge past the centre spot. Huge advantage. Now, I am told, Andrew, that this beautiful table uh, is one of two 
and that you own its twin, is that correct? Yeah, well, I'll, there's more than two of them. It's, it's one of a pair that were made one after the other or at the same time at Alcock's factory. But, yeah, it's, it's really a nice touch to me for me to come down to a lovely billiards environment like this and see a table that's virtually identical to the one I've got at home. It's really a nice feeling. Yes. And is yours set up like this? Straw and super fine and... No, not, not with this cloth and I, I need... The cloth's nearly 10 years old. I'm in the process of getting a new cloth on it but it won't be this grade of cloth. It'll be the uh, 30, Club ounce, grade. Th 30 ounce cloth. Yes. Same as they have at Yarravel, which I play, played on a couple of years ago, and I, I quite like. And I, even at the age I am, which uh, late 60s, I'm still playing the game, and I still have a vague ambition of maybe playing in the Australian Championship at Yarravel one day. Fantastic. Oh, what's the best break you've made on your home table? Well, funnily... It was only about six weeks ago and I've been playing or fiddling and experimenting with top of the table for three or four years and I've gradually got better and um, I managed, and it, modest by these fellow standards and by most people's standards, but I managed to get my first hundred break ever. Well so done. That, that, that was a milestone for me, but... Uh, yes. The, the problem I have, country New South Wales, Young's actually where I'm from, which <coughs> some people will know where it is, we're out, well out in the bush. And uh, I'm, well, we have no full size tables left in the town of Young, which is a population of about 7,000. I, I have one of the few full size tables, but of course in a private residence. And there's no competitive billiards within about 100 miles or 160 kilometres of, yes. uh, of uh, Young. So, my well, it's place. another one gone wrong for Peter. My opportunities are very limited and my play mm. is restricted to basically practice. Yes. Which has always been disappointing to me. And, yes. Uh, because, I mean, billiards is a, a lovely, lovely game. Um, yes. I don't think there's a, another table game quite like it. Yes. So uh, another standard leave. Every time Sarov comes to the table, he has a choice of shots. Absolutely standard half ball for him there. Push the red over the middle bag. White near a pocket. Uh, it's just all in front of him. So red pot in off yellow. Bring that ball back into play. So lovely shot there, choice of shots here. We'll probably play in off the yellow to develop it into drop cannon position. No, he's going to play a red first, just to improve that angle a little bit. So now he has the angle that he wants. He'll cross the table once to set up drop cannon. He's got that into the middle actually, he's going to do it in two steps more reliable. In fact, this is what Walter Lindrum recommended, uh, was to do it in two steps, push it up towards the pyramid spot, and then bring it around off two cushions. Left a thinnish drop cannon, so he might have to play an in-off to bring it out from the cushion a bit further. Does that might not have it up high enough so he might have to play uh, some right hand side on this if he wants to play it direct or else play it off the cushion it's right hand side slip below it a little so andrew uh, many of our viewers and readers especially those from australia uh, will know you from your writings. Uh, Andrew's the author of uh, Walter's only real biography, uh, Walter Lindrum, Billiards Phenomenon. And the good news for your dedicated 
followers is that there's another work in the offing. Can yeah. you tell us a little bit about that without giving away the whole story? Um, it's been a very long-winded process. You're right, uh, Peter, it's, it's happening. It's been very long-winded. Running for almost 20 years, which to some people will sound absolutely ridiculous, but if you look at it in the context that it's a labour of love, um, and a labour of love in this situation means that I will expect to make absolutely no money out of it. It's, uh, when, by the time you add up the cost of uh, involved and the number of hours, uh, that doesn't worry me because it's, it's a personal satisfaction job. And I have a full-time occupation to sustain, so that's how I struck out over 20 years. And You're an orchardist? Yeah, we have an orchard at, at, at Young. Cushion first cannon, half ball off the yellow. And uh, so consequently I only work on Lindrum things when I feel like I have a little bit of spare time. Rainy days are a, an open invitation to get in front of the computer uh, and work away. But uh, Now I'm going to tease you a little bit <coughs> Excuse me. and ask you a hard question. And I want an honest answer. Do you want to finish this or are you enjoying the process? Because we've all been on your case for quite some time saying, <laughs> come on, Andrew, let's get it done. Uh, but uh, it, 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 it has gone on, as you say, for almost a couple of decades now. Uh, what do you do if you finish it? It's a very good question. And, and actually, uh, this might, might sound strange, but if, in some ways it'll be quite sad when I, 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 I finish it. I you might say that. <clears throat> because... Uh, researching and writing and thinking and everything about Walt Lindham that's gone on since about 1977 yes and that's a long long time to have something filling your it, head it, going around in your head um, yes. and it'll be a strange feeling bec um, when it when it's all finally happens I mean it'll be very satisfying yeah um, I'm sure that'll be the case but, but uh, uh, there's a part of you, I suspect, that doesn't want to finish it. That's probably right, um, but it, it, it happened. And actually, there's, there's times when, I, to be honest, I thought it would never get finished. Um, We've I, all thought that, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder why, Peter, I wonder why. That's right. But no, it, it's, it's gained a bit of momentum again in the last couple of years, and there's nice progress being made. And I, I would think I have the book about half done which um, probably sounds encouraging to all those very patient people that have been so, about so uh well that's good news so 20 years uh, so we're expecting a release date watch this space <laughs> 2039 now uh dolly's passing must have been very poignant to you she was the last of the melbourne-based lindrums yeah well Dolly actually was in a very unique situation. Uh, Dolly, well, Walter was living in the family home in Melbourne. Uh, and Dolly's mother died in South Australia after childbirth, complications in 1922. And Dolly was effectively adopted by her grandparents and became the went into the same household as Walter. And she spent the majority, not all, but the vast majority of her life from the from the age of a few months um, in the same house as Walter. So, yes. uh, and plus, so not only in the house, but also in the Flinders Lane billiard room where Walter often was and Dolly was. Uh, so they spent an awful lot of time together. And uh, they were Would very... Would it be fair to say that he, she was like... Uh, more like a daughter than a niece? Definitely. Yes. Uh, definitely. Uh, they were extremely close. It can't be overstated how close they were. Um, having said that, I mean, Dolly, Walter doted on Dolly, and Dolly yes. absolutely adored Walter. But having said that, um, Dolly was an interesting lady because uh, despite the fact that she loved Walter intensely, she wasn't beyond letting 
him know if, if she felt he'd done something wrong or if he'd done something she didn't approve of, she, she'd let him know. Uh, but despite all that, I mean, the bond was just incredibly close. Mm -hmm. So I was fortunate to have basically open access to not only Dolly but the the uh, billiard room at Kerford Road over many, many years and uh, she was a great help to me. Told me some things that uh, made me sit up and listen uh, in a very concentrated way and with her passing earlier this year I'm just grateful that that, that happened because otherwise there'd be quite a few facts and, and stories lost uh, she was for, really forever. The the custodian of the family history, the torchbearer oh, yeah, yeah. for both the physical property and the uh, the memories and the and the uh, public persona of the family. Yeah, well, she, she was um, um, very protective of the Lindrum name and very protective of, of had been remembered who who and what Walter Lindrum was. Uh, do you feel that she sanitised the family history to some extent, or...? Well... She did, uh, but in a fairly limited way, and I mean, that's only natural if you think about yeah, your own family situation. We're, we're all trying to put the best face on things. Yeah. Um, there a few, a few little things. There about the spotting, I think. And there's a... Uh, Shake of the head by Sora. He's an interesting player, this fellow. He, I'll He's a very fine player. Uh, uh, plays a very nice game. I'll show you one of his funny, or I'll point out, it's probably already been pointed out, but I'll show you one of his mannerisms yeah. in a while when he's confronted with an awkward situation. But it's, it's, to me, it's quite amusing, and he probably doesn't even realise he's doing it himself, I'd say. He's a focus of concentration, but uh, I'll wait for the opportunity. It'll, I'd say it'll happen. He's had to come up now twice after two red pods because he just can't get into the right shape on this yellow. He needs to either be below it and play a uh, correcting cannon coming back to push it behind the spot uh, or he needs to play for an in off the yellow. Again, he's, he's uh, come up a bit short, not come up short, he's elected to, to play the easy cannon rather than try and get down into a position that'll uh, give him options. But he's moved the yellow close to the pocket, which was the main goal in that shot. And he's got in off the red now, so he's trying to figure out how many steps back to top of the table, which is where they all want to be. Surprising miss. Peter comes to the table with, again, nothing easy on. And that's been the, the, the main difference, I think, here, is that every time Soros has come to the table, he's had a half ball something. Peter comes to the table and he's going to have to fabricate something from a very ugly situation. In off white seems to be the obvious one, but red's not in great shape. White's losable here. Just, just, just gets it out. I'd take the opportunity to move the red. Choices are in off the white or move the red. Could actually come close to getting top of the table in one here if he hits a perfect shot. Not far off it. He's now got the white where he hasn't had it for the entire match. But now he has to still figure out the red. Had he been full on the red, he would have been absolutely plum perfect. In and out. So setting up the reverse drop cannon. Bonus. Big bonus there. He's caught the jaw with the red. That gives him red pot to dress drop down into absolutely plum top of the table position. Mm. 
So stun up for the recovery cannon coming back. So here he's going to go red cushion white. Needs to just tap the white. Like so. Beautiful shot. Now we want to give a shout out to, to one of our dear Indian friends that couldn't make uh, this journey. And that's uh, Raja Subramanian. And uh, Raja has asked us to uh, mention that uh, he would like to see Q Sports reintroduced to the World Disability Games. Uh, Raja is uh, a disabled competitor himself. Uh, but one would never know it if you looked at his scores. He's uh, a prolific scorer and uh, able to knock in uh, double and triple centuries and compete uh, with the able-bodied players uh, with uh, a number of disabilities. Uh, he's a, a tremendous cueist, a uh, hell of a nice guy, and uh, we'd like to enlist your support to get uh, Q Sports, particularly uh, snooker and billiards, back into the World Disabilities Games. Hasn't been in there since 1988. But it's obviously something which uh, Raja proves is, is capable of being played by people with numerous different disabilities. Well, Peter would have been absolutely relieved when he, he got to the top. And yes. Got got this opportunity my prediction is that he's when you get frustrated like that when the chance comes yeah you grab it firmly with both hands and you take it so uh, let, let's hope he can go on yes. to make it at least a nice hundred um there's scope it's, for it's quite really a few more it's really the only fixed uh, you know the run of outs that he's had the only thing that will uh improve his uh, mental state is to knock in a big break and uh very strategic very strategically important part of the match now he doesn't want to go into the break trailing by 300 or more so he really has an opportunity now in the next 10 or 15 minutes to try and recoup some of that loss uh, and to and to regain the momentum if he fails here and Sora puts another 200 on him then we have a very, very different match. All the pressure is on Peter. So he's crossed that over in the hope of getting up to the middle spot. Got a reasonably simple half ball in off here. Has to avoid potting the red. So he's played it the thin way. What control to that's, leave that one inch out of... That's what you call judgment. Ball. That's what you call judgment. So he's played in off that and figured out the pace to drop it into the pocket. Now he wants to be on this side of the table, so that suits him because the white's on this side of the table. So now plays a cannon. So it's red cushion white, I think. Chipping the red thinly across to towards the pocket. That's fine, knocks it up on the on the line as it's called, side to side of the table. Depending on his angle here, he could elect to flick off the outside of the white. No, it just moves it along. So he's gonna have to figure out a recovery eventually for this. Approaching the balk line warning at 80 points. Okay has to stun this across so in doing so will separate the balls a little bit further so he elects instead to play the red and try and get his yellow ball further away oh oh <laughs> it was a red pot but he's missed it by far enough that he's uh, actually made a flute cannon and grateful he is 
So tried to bring that across into drop counter position. I think he's come up short. To make this, he would be playing big right-hand side. So Andrew, a uh, number of the players went out to visit the Lindrum house at 158 Kerford Road, Albert Park, uh, yesterday and uh, were stunned by the material that was out there, the memorabilia, uh, and were not aware that that um, house was still there. And they've asked the question, and I'll ask you and see whether you know the answer, about what is likely to happen to that collection and what will you, you might like to see happen to that collection. Not that it's up to you. Lost the white ball. <coughs> so. Yeah, well, that's a good question. Um, there's dispute within the Lindrum family. Um, over it and it's uh, yet to be resolved. Dolly Lindrum's wish was for the memorabilia to go into the uh, Melbourne Hall of Fame or the Melbourne Cricket Museum. Yes. Um, but that's been disputed by uh, Jan Lindrum, daughter of uh, Horace. Horace Lindrum. Um, and it's it's quite a complicated situation. There's a scenario appears like that might be developing, but I I don't want to uh, come out with a, a prediction that's proven wrong. We're hoping and, um, that the collection will stay in Melbourne somewhere. Um, it, it it is historically connected to Melbourne, of course. The uh, Lindrum Rooms. Um, the Lindrum Billiard Room. Uh, it's it's a Melbourne story and arguably West Australian story too, uh, with Walter having been born in West Australia, but um, uh, primarily a Melbourne story, I think. Yeah, it, it's um, so it, it'll all happen sooner or later. Hopefully, in a way that um, it's kept together yeah. and accessible. Uh, for I think Australians and, and billiard players, snooker players and sporting people in general to uh, go and have a look at. But interesting, you um, talking about the um, players who were fortunate to see it yesterday being stunned. Um, I had other commitments and couldn't get out there, unfortunately. Um, but Tammy Lindrum, that's uh, Horace Lindrum's younger daughter, was out there and took a few photos and uh, I was, I suppose, not stunned, but I was uh, pleasantly surprised with what I saw. Uh, I've been in that house many times um, and seen a lot of material, photos, letters and so on. But I'm... I'm almost ex or quite excited or uh, of how much material that is floating around tucked away in drawers in cupboards and so on that um, I haven't seen that uh, could be very very interesting. Have you seen Graham McNeil's scrapbooks? Yeah I've, uh, I think I've seen all those. And, uh, he's, uh, he's copied and reprinted all of the uh, press clippings Um, a little, little aside, I'm fortunate enough to own one of the uh, scrapbook uh, books that uh, happened not to get tangled up in the uh, the litigation that's ongoing. Um, yes. And that's one of my uh, nice Walter Lindrum items. I have quite a few of them that are <coughs> um, highly valued and or 
and, and, and treasured by me. Peter, Peter has done it again. I, I think it's just out of Bork. Uh, very fine judgment. Gives him a chance to get that white out off the cushion, get it out into the open, but he might be able to do something with it. It's even in a much better position now and with a, a short Jenny on offer, should the situation arise. Um, in another stroke or two, might, might be this second next stroke. May not either. No, he's probably electing for a screw cannon. Oh, looking for the top. Hasn't quite got it, but uh, he's still in position to carry on. Very important little break, this one. It's yes. one of those breaks you'd say... Bit of a let off from Saurav, so he's, uh, he's back in. Uh, now less than 200 in the difference. As I said, critical time, 16 minutes until the break. Um, Peter is uh, about six foot six inches tall, and you can see that uh, with his long legs, he actually bends down to get onto the table. So, so uh, his hips are higher than higher than the uh, table that means that like mark williams he can <coughs> queue under his body when he needs to as if he didn't have enough advantages uh in terms of talent the downside of that is that peter <laughs> suffers from bad back problems from time to time it's been a bit of a recurring injury if you like years of bending over Starting to look a little bit smoother, starting to move a little bit faster. Less than ideal there, the red hasn't come up nearly as high as he would have wanted. Greetings to all of our viewers from around the world, to those in the UK, New Zealand, India, Canada, the fine gentleman from the Winnipeg, Winnipeg uh, Veterans English Billiards League. From our, to our friends in Austria, Ireland, Myanmar, Malaysia, uh, all around the globe. And for those of you who are perhaps new to billiards, we would commend again the uh, video that's been produced by the organising committee here, uh, which is called How to Play Billiards. It gives you a quick expose of what the hell's going on here. It can be hard to follow, difficult to understand for the uninitiated but beautiful to uh, play and watch for those who understand what's going on. Well, here's a tricky shot. I don't think it's on this way. Peter will know better than me, but uh, he's looking at it to see whether he can play it with massive right-hand side. Now he's thinking about a masse off the cushion. Freehand masse, he can reach all the way over there. Go on, Peter, do it. Freehand Masse. I think he's going to play with strong right hand side off the yes. top cushion, try and clip the red and try and cross stun on. across. Oh, yep, he's done it. very well. And the result will be quite. I'm always hoping. <laughs> no, it's not quite anything. It's a bit no, ugly. He's, he's still got a good chance. Yeah. 
The way Peter Chip plays with me, he'll, he'll play a fine enough into the middle I, with a lot of side. I, I'm, I'm predicting, but I've, my track record at predicting is not real good. So let's well, that's the thing. Let's no, see if I can get one right. No, nobody is very, very good at predicting. This is not like predicting snooker, which is kind of uh, one-dimensional. There are five ways to score here. Okay, so screw cannon was the answer. Here it comes. With five ways to score, uh, it makes this notoriously difficult to commentate. That's a lovely shot. That's a lovely shot. 165 the difference now. Peter hasn't looked like he's been in it. Uh, so it's actually surprising how close it is. In fairness, he didn't have anything to look at when he came to the table in the first hour and 15 minutes. So I'm stuns up. I'm sure what Peter would, love, uh, Peter would love to do here is hold the table for the rest of the session and score... Absolutely. Maybe 100, maybe 150 points. Get right himself right back into the match and, and have first crack next session. Well, he's 63 already. If he can get them tied at top, he could, uh, with 11 minutes left, he could score over 200. That's quite possible. But as you say, I think his main goal at this stage, no matter what the rate of scoring, is to hold the table and stop the blood loss, basically. That looks a bit more fluent now. He's starting to look a bit, a little bit like Peter Gilchrist from Singapore. <coughs> Choice of shots. Probably screw around behind the white to leave a, an angle for the correcting cannon. Got one right for a change. Me, that is, not Peter. Correct call. You can see how he's speeding up as he gets into the more familiar territory of top of the table. These players practice this so much that it's actually almost a form of meditation. They can almost turn the conscious mind off and just let the subconscious play the shots in some ways the less you think about it the easier it is almost a zen state of meditation Our referee here is Kim Ivet. This is in fact the first time that a woman has ever refereed a World Billiards Final. Just grazed that white. Just grazed it. If he intended it to be that thin, then that shot will have given him a lot of confidence. If he didn't intend it to be that thin, it will have frightened the life out of him. Correcting Cannon coming back. Push the white behind the spot again. Come up on the high side of the red to leave a red pot. Perfect. So very close to directly behind the spot now. Um, Dan has just pointed out, and that's a wonderful question, Dan. Have we had a balk line crossing? I don't know that we have. I was wondering the same thing, Peter. This will have to be a screw back. He's not liking this at all. Thank you, Dan, for that observation. We'd entirely missed it. We can't hear the referee's calls here. So uh, this is a complete puzzle for Peter. If he scores and doesn't cross the balk line, then it's a foul and Sorov has them respotted. 
That's actually not a terrible result from Peter's point of view, in that at least he hasn't got them into respot position, which is a standard position. So Sorov comes to the table, but uh, I wonder if Peter just forgot the ball climb crossing there. It didn't look like he was ever playing to set it up. I, I was actually playing him in Leeds, <laughs> and he did forget the ball climb crossing. Okay, another let off. Peter will be giving a big sigh of relief. Yes. And, he's and got another, for a change, another, he's got to leave. Another uh, good opportunity here to get going again. You know, off in the middle. White in good usable position, we hope. Although he's got them. Needs separated. a big bounce here. Big bounce, big bounce. Doesn't get it. Yeah, so, uh, so I was playing Peter in Leeds, which me playing Peter involves me sitting down an awful lot and Peter playing an awful lot. But uh, the referee warned him for a ball line crossing. And then when he made 100, uh, fouled Peter, and he said, you didn't warn me. Uh, and Peter's father, Frank, who was sitting in the front row, said, oh, yes, he did. So thank you, Frank. Peter's shoulders drop there. Shake of the head. Hasn't left anything easy. If he rescues one ball, he's still got to contend with the other one. Perhaps screw in off the yellow. Leaves him long Jenny position. But none of this is easy. Okay, so he's made a cannon, but again... Nothing elementary to follow. Skinny in off the yellow. Doesn't fancy it. How's, how's the... Uh, Short Jenny position? Jenny, it's a little bit tight, but play of his calibre. Plenty of side well, on and the right contact. One way or another, he's playing check side. So loads of right hand side in this case manages to squeeze it in this does have an in off the yellow here but um, he can't get it close to the red from this position so he'll have to play one or more intervening shots to eventually get them together now he can look more seriously at that short Jenny because he's in hand and he can get to set whatever position he actually wants having a look at that now deciding against that takes the finger marks off the cloth doesn't want anything to go wrong here tough shot yeah those run-throughs on this cloth are very difficult. Might have left close to short Jenny position for Pierre. Uh, those run-throughs are very, very difficult on this cloth, which just reacts very quickly to uh, any ball with pace on it. Screwing off. Beautifully played. Wants this to pull up. It doesn't. So, for the third time, one of the players inspects the short Jenny and decides against it. Now Peter can bring this ball around off three cushions. Three. And gets it on the same side of the table as the red. And now by pushing the white up and down the table off one cushion, in off white obviously into the middle, but off one cushion now he can put it next to the red and try and rescue that red from there. So he's worked out essentially three shots ahead. Uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. Oh. Oh. Dear, oh dear. Dear, oh dear, oh dear. 
I'm still a bit bemused why neither of them wanted to tackle that short Jenny off that red. Uh, it must have, well, they both inspected it, saw her twice, Peter once. Uh, didn't fancy it, that's all you can say. Perhaps that's why you and I are not playing on this final, Andrew. I'm not... Oh, touch of good fortune there. I mean, he did play to hit the red and probably did play for that shot, being a half ball, but honestly, it's a, it's a lottery as to whether you get it. Now yeah. he's looking at pot red, recover the white with an in off into the... Uh, you, know, you know, Peter, um, you and me are both professionals. We, we're professional spectators. That's it. That's it. Uh, no, I'm a step up from that. Like you, I'm a professional spectator with an opinion. So, like all good sports fans, we've got an opinion about, about everything, but leave it to the experts to produce the shots. So in off here will push the white just out of balk. Now he controls this. In off into the middle, push the white ball across into drop cannon position. Well, Peter's position's looking a lot better it was than it was, say, an hour I'll ago. I'll say, uh, 120 the difference. A minute left on the clock. How delicate was that? Yes. Good drop cannon position. Wide a bit far out from the rail, so he'll battle to get this all the way back to the red spot. Uh, it's not, not perfect, but um, he'll probably end up with the white ball on the right-hand side of the table as we're looking at it. I oh, know, manages to push it all the way down there by manipulating it with side. They're tight, but he's going to separate them here. Wants to separate them as little as he can. Look at that reach. He's like an albatross. It's obscene, Peter, isn't it? It's, it's, it's a disgrace, Andrew. It's, it's just not, obscene. It's not, it's not fair. Not fair. He's a, doesn't want it to drop. It drops, but not a disaster. Well, Can he slip through here, slip through cannon? Yeah, nice, fine, little, fine. nice little fine one. Fine, fine. Fine, fine. Done well. Yep. He may get one more shot in before time. I may not. Well, our video, the screen time here is not necessarily an accurate reflection of ah. the clock in the arena. So we're down to zero here, but they're still playing. But shortly they'll be stopping. Before the start of the final session, we will try and synchronise so that we know. In case we have a split second finish. And that's the end of the first two hour session. And uh, Andrew Ricketts, thank you so much for joining me. And uh, we will be resuming here at four o'clock with uh, David Pitt and Chris Coombe in the chair. So thank you viewers. Bring your friends along. 3 p.m. we're screening the um, Walter Lindrum documentary. If you haven't seen it, it's a fantastic uh, doco. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you very much through the The second session begins at four o'clock, so you have effectively just under an hour and a half to go and get yourself some refreshments. Um, and after the second session, there will be a game of Scotch doubles. So don't go away immediately after the second session ends. I invite all of you to be here for a, uh, a thing that's been put on by the Lindrum legends for the Scotch doubles. But for the moment, let's go and have some lunch and look after yourself. Thank you very much. Thank you, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Prem, how are you? Good man, how are you? How are you been, Coming down on Tuesday to the... Uh, yeah, coming down yeah, to the... Where? Franks. Two Franks and two. Hard to get to. I think John will pick me up. John